Hungarian emigre arriving in a foreign land, uh, speaking the language, but in his own inimitable style and believing that not always understood, and suspicious of quite a lot of English, the English establishment. And his arrival, frankly, here was very timely. What the house needed was energizing. And one of Scholte's first things on arrival was to say, I'm going to make this into the greatest opera company in the world. And that's what everybody in this house wanted to hear. It was a very exciting time. Uh, it was a, you could feel this was the beginning of an era. You, you thought, this is, this, is, this is history in the making here. We're getting international singers and marvelous new works we were doing. And he was suddenly pushing it up into the International League. Partito il fil laudate, accostati ben mio, tutte così mi piace a me, che con piacente femmina che sposa di buon cor gibilò. Around 64, I had difficulties with the press. They didn't believe in a way of I'm doing Mozart. It was a new production, Figaro, uh, produced by this excellent Austrian producer, Oskar Fritz Schuh, and I thought it was very good, but I hated it. By then, there were a lot of protests from the audience. Uh, part of the protest was we can't hear the singers, the orchestra's too loud. And there was something of a campaign being launched, in fact, to get rid of him by some section of the public. The moment a poster went up advertising a new production conducted by Georg Scholte, a graffito artist would come across and scrawl, Scholte must go across it. And the cotton, the, the company had constantly to be changing the bills outside the house. And then it was some point, somebody scratched my car. As I see the Mercedes, it was very unpleasantly. I knew that he's some nasty young boy. Just one or two, I mean, it's not serious. And then thrown one of the premier. All along that time, a vegetable basket done, onions and potatoes. Remember Covent Garden in those days, it was the wholesale vegetable market. And uh, one night, uh, there was a, a cauliflower with a shorty must go thing stuck on it, got rolled, lobbed across the footlights. It was depressing, but it doesn't matter. You have to know what you want, not dithering, and not say, ah, they don't like me, let's do something else. No, you go through your way, and you have to be patient. If you want something new, it will be naturally opposition. So it was. He hit this place like a whirlwind, quite honestly. And it was noticeable that in no time at all, everybody was taking their instruments home to practice. <laughs> it was like having a, a really good orchestral trainer. The orchestra in those days, it was a very mixed bag. And um, there were many people that played in cinema orchestras, uh, military bands, a lot of the brass came from the brass bands. He was often correcting what we would look on as nowadays as basic mistakes or problems, like getting rhythms together. Uh, a classic one being the dotted rhythm, sort of da, 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 which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And so George would, no, no, boo, 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 boo. Pa, pa, pa. Give the main emphasis on the last note, yes? On the last note and very late. Pa, pa, pa. You would never take no for an answer from a player if you told him a thing was impossible, he would say, I mean, this actually happened. He'd say, yes, yes, I know you can do it. You must practice more. The essential would be clear queries. Clear. That you make it really clear. That's excellent. May I ask that main motif, that, that Hollander motif? Each quote I get an accent, yes? Pa 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 And I would like to do the appoggiatura on the third horn also. Do it. Pa pa ra pa ra. But on the beat, don't come before. Pa ra pa ra pa ra. Nearly on the legatos. Just come in, horn and bassoon, please. <laughs> It's fine. 
if you could manage me the A a little longer, nearly no break between, a kind of legato, a kind of legato. Okay, let's start. And very much ask you, the upbeat is very essential. They have fought the steel, so come out. Pa, pa, pa. Sir George was a tremendous personality and very, very gradually we grew to like him and to, to respect him without any doubt. And some of the fear went away and one, one is almost loved him because he meant so much. This is the BBC Third programme. Tonight we are relaying from the Royal Opera House Covent Garden a performance of Schoenberg's last opera, Moses and Aaron, of which this is the first stage production in this country. The opera is produced by Peter Hall. Part of Moses and Aaron is kind of the grandest grand opera that's ever been. It's the first huge opera I'd ever done, and they don't come any huger. I mean, I, I think I had over 300 people on the stage at Covent Garden. And I found it intolerably difficult. I started during Christmas holiday, I remember, in my chalet in Villa. And I, many times I was on verge, I said, I can't do it. The Opera House hired me, I think, five or six strippers from Soho. But because of the Lord Chamberlain's needs, they had to have very large pieces of elastoplast placed on their nipples. I was just very angry with Peter at one point when those naked virgins came, which is very difficult to score. I had no time to look up and I had to watch the score. I was very angry about it at that point. Everybody could see except me. Scholte is precision incarnate. And in a sloppy world, which frankly opera, both musically and dramatically, usually is, a world of sentimentality and approximation uh, and um, rather indulgent emotions. His precision was, was a wonderful corrective. I find a wonderful contrast and a surprise in him in that insofar as someone who can be as authoritarian, as strict, as precise, as, as rhythmically demanding in, in his music, can also be such an amiable man. Oh, it's even faster. Or at 16. It sounds like a shopping pool. So, no, someone's backing, someone's backing up. <laughs> no, let's do just that. <clears throat> sometimes it gets to you. <laughs> I sometimes think, I wish we didn't have that little ding, 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 ding. But it's, it's very good because at least you know exactly where you are. And I think from my early days, this is what I always found with him. You were never, you could never get the rhythm out of place. So once he was set on a certain rhythm, you knew you didn't have to look at him for several bars because you knew you could turn back and he was in the same place. It was, it, that's, it was very secure. <laughs> A he was the most incredible person. I, I adored him the moment I saw him. I was terrified. Of course, everyone is terrified when you first meet him. Good girl. But I, I just saw the funny side of him. Because the funniest side of all was he looked like my father. Uh, he, he, had the, he walked the same. His head, the way he bends his head was all the same. So I just kept on thinking I was talking to my father all the time. And, and, and from that point on, I, I just ne always laughed at him. Not rudely, but I, I always saw a funny side to him all the time. Uh, that was wonderful, wicked eyes. We, we can start. His discipline and his uh, sense of authority and is never malicious and never without a sense of helping the artist. Just shortly before to the very end of the I've just been talking to the artists about the rehearsal of Bocanegra, and they absolutely love being worked over and coached this way, and they don't get it anywhere else. 
He has this uh, amazing charm by which he can bully the artists and pester them with this kind of Hungarian glamour and charm. It's absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, I think it's one of the things about Hungarians is that, like Alexander Korda and Zsa Zsa Gabor, that you know, they, they carry with them great glamour, and he created great glamour around the opera house. <laughs> I think the date of our first meeting was either, I think it was the 3rd or 4th of September, early, 1964. Very, very early September. How it all happened was that I was doing an arts program for the BBC, for television. I arrived in my green minivan, which was my pride and joy. And they said, oh yes, Dr. Schulte is waiting for you in his room. I thought, ooh. Yes, that's it. This is the door. There it is. I stood here and I knocked. They reply. So I knocked again and a voice said, What do you want? And I said, I'm from the BBC. I've come to interview you. And then there was total silence and shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And then the door opened and a face peered out that was swathed in steaming towels and said, What do you want? And I said, I'm from the BBC. I've come to interview you. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'd forgotten the time. Closed the door again. There I was in the corridor. About 30 seconds later, the door opened. And there was sort of Rocky Marciano, Cassius Clay figure, wrapped up in a bathrobe and towels. Opened the door and said, please come in. I was it's ushered into the room. And uh, the, the figure in the towels said to me, I will get dressed, disappeared back into the bathroom, and then turned around and said, please, could you find my socks? So there I was in this room. There was the bed. There was sort of clothes a bit all over the place. And came this rather beautiful lady, a sort of future Miss America or Miss UK or something like that, not BBC. Because the BBC for me represents always old ladies, or rather fatty, bosomy old ladies. And that was something different. So that, that was my first impression. Out of that became an endless saga 35 years now. <laughs> I was separated, my first wife, and she was married. I mean, more, more I mean, it was immoral the, cannot be, is it? It was the most unlikely 
situation. We, um, he said to me, I think, three days after we'd met here, I want to marry you. And I said, don't be so ridiculous. I've never heard anything more outrageous in my life. It was so. We got married on the 11th of November, 1967. Good, Armistice Day. It's the last peace day in <laughs> our life. <laughs> but I don't diminish her influence on me by saying that a major change in my life came with my two children. I was 57 years old when my first daughter, Gabrielle, was born. And I was nearly 60 when my second daughter, Claudia, was born. And you know, I always say that two things made me really a believer. It's a very strange combination, the two, but it is. It is. The one is Mozart. I was one of the second. My first daughter, Gabrielle, was 40 minutes old. I think. And I hold this little child, and she opened her eyes like that. And I knew there is behind that eye a soul just born. And that cannot be by chance again. That teaches you that something above you, which you don't know what, but somebody is above you. Baseball today, the Cubs win this game ended. Houston beat us three to nothing. Chicago's weather tonight, cloudy, windy, and warm. Tomorrow, windy and warmer. The high tomorrow, about 75. Although I was nearing 60, I had never held a post as a music director with a symphony orchestra. I stayed at the Royal Opera House until 1971. But by then, a new world had opened up. The Chicago Symphony is really a fate for me, was from the very beginning. I fell in love with this orchestra. Immediately, first sight, love first sight, really. It sounds not too phony maybe, but it wasn't. And when I finished here, two weeks, I went back to my American agent. I said, if you get me an engagement, Chicago Symphony, every year I'm coming. So it was. When Maestro Schulte joined us in the late 60s, 69, I believe, the orchestra was a bit, shall we say, demoralized. We'd been through some uh, somewhat difficult years for any number of reasons. There have been certain members of this orchestra who didn't talk to each other at all. It certainly was a rehearsal in which the first flute stood up and loudly said, I can't take that anymore, and out went. Just like that, just left, left. I knew very well, instinctively, this is a decisive moment. If I tolerate that, my days are numbered. Okay, that's that. So I asked the two gentlemen to my room, and I said to them, very heartfelt, it was real. You either make peace right now here in my presence or I leave you immediately. You can look another man. I am not staying for a day longer. And they knew I am not joking. Because you can't work with such an atmosphere. So after that about was a short silence. And then said, Mr. Peck, the flutist. Oh, I think he's an excellent oboist. And Mr. Still said, oh, he's a first-class flutist. Welcome to the Usher Hall and to the 25th Edinburgh International Festival. A capacity audience has been assembling for tonight's concert, which is a very special occasion. This is the first public performance to be given anywhere outside North America by one of the great orchestras of the world, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Maestro Schulte, I know, made it very plain when he accepted the position here that if you want to be world class, you got to get out of Chicago once in a while. So we toured Europe for the very first time in 1971 for six weeks. George Schulte comes to the stand to conduct the Symphony No. 1 in C minor by Brown.
We had an absolutely marvelous trip. The concerts went extremely well. Everyone was very excited about doing this. He meant to make us a world-class group, and I think he did just that. You see, they'd never heard them. They'd never seen them because people didn't come to America a lot then, as they do now. And suddenly there it was in Europe, playing all in Milan or playing all, all of, in Frankfurt, playing in Munich, everywhere. Berlin, London, Berlin, Berlin. Salzburg, everywhere, everywhere. We had a ticker tape parade, and it was amazing because it's very narrow and dark, almost like canyons, the streets. And you looked up, and there were all these pieces of people, paper, the ticker tape, right. people in the office windows waving, and all the paper coming down. It was, coming very amazing. Down. It was it really quite amazing. extraordinary. Like a football and, and suddenly, team. the orchestra became part of the identity of this city because it had always been here, but suddenly there was an enormous input of feeling and joy that the city had got this wonderful orchestra. Not it was a sleeping beauty, really. We had not only forgotten, but the city was famous for Al Capone. And certainly, they know, the world knew the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. George Schulte imprinted this orchestra and himself on the city of Chicago by his own dynamic personality and his conducting skills and what he helped to build and maintain with the orchestra. Uh, one year, the picture of George Schulte was on the front of the Chicago telephone book. Every once in a while, you will hear a sports analyst say, you know, he controls batters the way George Schulte controls musicians. What's interesting to me about that is that not only that the sportscaster knows George Schulte, but assumes that his audience, the sports audience, will know who he's talking about. Uh, you would never have that happen in any other city in this country. I was music director of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for 22 years until 1992. But we never moved here. Valerie and I had already made our home in London. The decision not to move was one of the most difficult in my life. We had two small children, and as long as they were little, they were able to travel with us. But when they started school, the situation became difficult. We believed, rightly or wrongly, that the education in England is much superior to the education here. So the children stayed in England, but the price was high. To pay for this wonderful orchestra and the first-class professional life, you sacrifice a little bit your family. Was it right or wrong? We will never find out. I think that since he became a family man, he has warmed up personally and musically. We've all experienced things like that in our own lives. And uh, it has an effect on his music making, of course. Well, there's no question that both musically and personally, he is a changing person, as we all are. 
These days, I'm just a freelance contactor. I am music director laureate of the Chicago Symphony, and I am back to perform and record the Shostakovich 15th Symphony, his last and one of his most personal works. My dear Mr. Koss, should you not try to use the hard stick? To, 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 I just said hard, I can use it. So would you try? 73, the 4-4. Four, four. Could you please, everybody, play 70 with a big trombone solo? 73. I made over 100 records, it's 120 approaching with the Chicago Symphony. But I no more believe in studio recordings. If you have a first class orchestra, then you can risk playing an hour music with very little mistake or no mistake at all. And you gain a live atmosphere which you in the studio. You can never have. There's nobody equal to him in the recording field. First of all, he, he loves the recording medium. He, he's so dedicated to it. Every recording he makes is something special. And there's nobody I've ever worked with who has that quality, that really, who really does believe in recordings, documenting something that is going to be um, for the future, posterity. I think his genius is letting the music speak for itself within the parameter of the beat. He doesn't have to stop and pick the daisies, so to speak, on a, on a long trip across Texas. If one got out of the car to pick every pretty flower that was there, when would the trip ever end and how would it have any meaning? There's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and one is drawn through the great line of the music. Life is a constant traveling, a constant journey, but equally a constant studying. Hello. Hello. I firmly believe that the last 15 years have progressed much more than 25 years before, and this keep me going and give me great happiness. has a such an internationality. My life is the clearest example. I do Hungarian music, I do French music, I do German music, English music, Italian, all the time. And I think I do it all well. Now, it wouldn't be possible if I feel chauvinistic in one way or the other. I don't think that music will achieve political unity. I don't think so. 
it may be help easing the hate, easing the non-conformity between the nations. It will help heal the wounds. That some afternoon, by the lake Balaton, seeing the graves of my grandparents, which I never seen before, and which through a miracle withstand time, that made me feel maybe first time ever in the last 40 years that a part of me belong still to Hungary. This is very moving and it's very disturbing, of course, because the history of my family lying in these graves, partly here, partly God knows where. And I know the God knows when, what that means. It means terrible things. But uh, I think we should forget that one. I'm glad that I could see that. And they very sweetly made this tree in memory of my visit. I hope the Third World War won't ruin that one. I can only hope. And where I am, what I am. I'm no Hungarian anymore, no English. A so-called cosmopolitan, which is an awful word. Yeah, what I am? A musician. A musician with a family, which I love. That's my life.